Amen. Well, thank you very much for that. Love your senior pastor very much. Yeah, yeah, love him very much. Known him for a long time and love you very much too. And I'm thrilled to be here with you tonight. Let's, let's pray. Uh, just We already have and, and, uh, and we need to pray more. So why don't we go ahead and do that now? And so, Father, we've, we've worshipped you. We've worshipped your son. We've worshipped the spirit of God. And that's good and that's right. And we've prayed and we've asked that you would move uh, as your word is now preached. Uh, thank you that, that there is no pressure on me to bring about any uh, change. Uh, that, is, that is the work of the Spirit of God. That is not the work of man. Uh, so we are praying tonight that as your word goes out, you would do what we have been asking and praying for, that you would bring glory to yourself, that you would change hearts, that you would save people that don't know you. Um, and, and the reason why we are confident in our prayers is because we know we're praying according to your will. We're not just inventing things to pray about. We know we are praying according to your will when we are asking you to glorify yourself and transform us. So lead us now, we pray, as we open up to Matthew chapter 6. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good evening. And as you know, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 6. So please go ahead and turn there now in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 6. If you've got your pens ready to go, that would be great. And if you don't have a Bible, um, we would love to get a Bible in your hand. So if you want to raise your hand, if you don't have a Bible, please go ahead and put your hand up. We'll get a, a Bible to you. And, and that would be um, our gift to you. You can keep that Bible if you don't have a Bible. But Matthew chapter 6, you can just look up um, Matthew at the beginning of the Bible, find Matthew, find chapter 6, and we are going to start at verse 1. Um, and as we do that, as you're turning to Matthew chapter 6, let's go ahead and throw that first slide up on the screen, uh, because, because this iceberg is true for all of us in our lives. Because all of us have things that we do and, 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 and there's all, in all of us, there's reasons why we do those things. There's things that we do, and then there's reasons why we do those things. All of us have behavior that's above the surface, and then all of us have motives that lie below the surface. So every day, all day long, we are saying things, and we are doing things. But why? Why? Why do we say the things that we say? Why do we do the things that we do? Well, here's why. It's because of our motives. Our motives drive everything that we do. So let me ask you, before we even get started today, how often do you think about your motives? How often do you think about why you say the things that you say? How often do you think about why you do the things that you do. How often do you think about your motives? Because sometimes we can fall into a trap of thinking this way up on the screen, that if, if someone has good behavior, well, then that must mean that they have good motives. Or we can think this way up on the screen, that if someone has bad behavior, then that must mean they have bad motives. But there's this third category up on the screen. Third category, that, that sometimes someone can have good behavior, but bad motives. And one very clear example of this from the scriptures would be the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees, they were the teachers in ancient Israel. They were the Bible experts, but they were also experts in this. Experts in good behavior. They were experts in having good behavior. But here's what Jesus said about their motives up on the screen. Look what he said. He said, they do all their deeds to be seen by others. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. Let that sink in for a minute. Jesus is saying that everything that the Pharisees did, everything... Everything that these experts in the scriptures did, everything that these, these men who, who knew the scriptures like the back of their hand, everything that they did ultimately, ultimately was motivated by the desire to be seen by other people. And so here's the warning for us today. That if you and I aren't really careful 
we can very easily find ourselves doing the exact same thing. Where we are presenting ourselves a certain way on the outside with our behavior, but all the while being motivated on the inside by the desire to be seen and respected and praised and admired by other people. And that leads us into point number one, which is this. It's a warning. It's a warning. If I live to be seen by man, I will forfeit God's reward. If I live to be seen by man, I will forfeit God's reward. Have a look with me now at Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Jesus says this. He says, Beware. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. So notice that Jesus starts off with this word, beware. He's giving his disciples and all of us here today a a, a very, very serious warning. He's saying, beware, watch out, be careful. There's something really dangerous here. And what is he warning us about specifically? Well, look again at verse one. He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. And that word righteousness there, it means, it means correctness in behavior or outward forms of godliness. So here's what he's saying up on the screen. He's saying, beware of drawing attention to things like your devotional life. Or your good works. Beware of drawing attention to to the way that you help others. Or the ways that you serve. Beware of drawing attention to yourself about, about the ministry that you're involved in. If, up on the screen, if your motive is to be seen by man. And Jesus isn't giving us this warning for no reason. He's giving us this warning because all of us here today struggle with sin. All of us. We all struggle with sin. Therefore, we are all in danger of doing this. We're all in danger of doing things in order to be seen by others. So why is that the case? Why would you and I ever want to do things to be seen by others? Well, here's why. The Apostle Paul tells us why in Romans chapter 6, up on the screen. Look what he says. He says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. So here's what Paul's saying. He's saying that all of us have this thing inside of us called sin. It's a bottomless pit of evil and wickedness and it knows no bounds. And if you are here today and you are saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have been set free from slavery to it. And that's a really good place for an amen. So we're going to circle around to that again. Okay. (laughs) So if you're here today and you're saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, then that means you are no longer in slavery to sin. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes. However, it's still present. And Paul tells us what it's seeking to do. He says, he says, let not sin therefore reign. Sin is trying to reign over us. I mean, sin is trying to rule us. And then he says, don't let it, don't let it make you obey its passions. It wants us to obey its desires. Sin wants to control us. And what does sin want us to do exactly? Well, sin wants us to do this. Sin wants us to turn away from God and turn away from living for his glory and instead to focus on ourselves and live for our own glory. This is what sin wants us to do. And God describes this turning away in Jeremiah chapter 2 up on the screen. Look what God says in Jeremiah chapter 2. He says, For my people have committed two evils. Here's the first evil. 
they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. So God says, I am the fountain of living waters. I am everything that my people need. My people were facing me. They were drinking, but then they've turned away from me. They're being controlled by sin. They've given themselves over to sin, so they're turning away from me. That's the first evil. The second evil, he says, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So it's this picture of God's people drinking from God and, and, then, and, then, and then giving themselves over to sin, turning away, and then, and, then, and then seeking to dig some holes in the ground because maybe it will rain and then there'll be some rainwater, some disgusting, muddy, gross rainwater in this hole. And I'm going to stick my head in and slurp up the rainwater. But, but they're, they're broken. They can't even hold any water. It's this idea of turning away from God and seeking satisfaction somewhere else, replacing God with something else. And one of the biggest broken cisterns that can be in our lives is this up on the screen. The broken cistern of self-glory. The broken cistern of self-glory where we are, we are turning away from God and then we are doing things in order to be seen by others to get glory for ourselves and seeking to be satisfied in that. This is what sin wants us to do. Sin wants us to seek satisfaction in self-glory. So here's the question then. Does that mean that it's always wrong for us like, to do good works in front of other people? Does that mean that, that we should, if we do anything that's good, that we should make sure that we hide it and no one ever knows about it, no one ever sees it? Well, consider what Jesus said back in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. If you keep your finger in Matthew chapter 6, just flip back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Look what he says, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Jesus says this, he says, he says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. So Jesus says, let your light shine. Let others see your good works. Let them, let them see if your motive is that God would get the glory. In other words, don't shine so that others can see you. Shine so others can see him. So it's right for people to see our good works if our motive is that God would get the glory. But here's the problem. The problem is, is that so often we can find ourselves doing things in front of other people, not so that God would get the glory, but rather so that we would get the glory. And so Jesus warns us in, in Matthew 6 verse 1, he says, Beware of this. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people so that you may be seen by them. Now there's lots of different ways we can be seen by other people. Right? Like we can go find some people and we can do some things in front of them so they see us. Or we can go and do some things and then go find some people and tell them all about what we did. And we can be seen by them. But one of the primary ways that we can be seen by other people in our day, in this culture, is through what? Social media. Social media, because with social media, you actually don't have to do things in front of other people in order to be seen by them, because now you can be seen virtually. And you're not limited to just your friend group or just the people in your town or just the people in your country. Now the whole world can see all the things that you do. We have a, a way to show everyone in the world things like how devoted we are to God or all of our Bible knowledge or we could show everyone our good works. Now we have a way of making it look like our family is perfect and our marriage is perfect and our kids are perfect and our friendships are all perfect and our lives are all perfect and we can portray ourselves like everything is perfect. 
This is a massive temptation in our day. Consider this. There has never been a time when it has been easier to be seen by others than it is today. There has never been a time when it has been easier for us to portray ourselves exactly the way we want than it is right now today. And there has never been a time when it has been easier to become completely addicted to that than it is right now today. So we need to seriously consider what Jesus is saying to us in verse 1. He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Beware, beware. So in light of that, let's ask ourselves, why do I usually say the things that I say when I'm around other people? Is it, is it about God's glory or is it about my glory? Why, why do I usually do the kinds of things that I do when I'm around other people? Is it, is it for God's glory or is it for my glory? Why do I post the stuff that I post on social media? Why? Is it, is it about God getting glory? Or is it really about me getting glory? And man, it is, it is hard to ask ourselves questions like this. It's not, this isn't easy right now. It's difficult to truly examine our motives honestly. But here's the truth. Jesus loves us way too much to leave us where we are. And so he speaks to us today from his word because he wants to liberate us from living at the broken cistern of self-glory. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this about our passage today up on the screen. He said, I sometimes think that this is the most uncomfortable chap one of the most uncomfortable chapters to read in the scriptures. It's good for a guest preacher. <laughs> it probes and examines and holds a mirror up before us and it will not allow us to escape. There is no chapter which is more calculated to promote self-humbling and humiliation than this one, but thank God for it. And if you and I are looking into the mirror of Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 1 today, and if we're seeing clearly, if we're seeing with any degree of clarity, then here's what we're likely seeing right now on some level up on the screen. I do things to be seen by people. I mean, can we just admit that? I do things to be seen by people. And I personally really struggle with this. I struggle with this. This is a constant battle for me in my heart. How about you? Well, if you're not sure, here's what wisdom says right now. Wisdom says that right now would be a great time to just ask the Lord. So let's do that. Let's take a moment just right now, right where you are, in your seat, maybe you want to just even assume a posture of prayer. Lord, search, search our hearts. Lord, search my heart. Lord, show me Show me if this is happening in my life. Lord, show me where this is happening in my life. Where I'm doing things to be seen by others. Lord, whose praise have I been longing for? Lord, whose praise have I been trying to chase down? What have I been doing in order to be seen by others in a certain light? What exactly have I been doing? 
Lord, where have I been living for self-glory? Where have I been living for self-glory? What does that look like in my life? Because if we're living to be seen by others, and if we will not repent, Jesus tells us what will happen. Look back at verse 1. He says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then, for then, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So consider what Jesus is actually saying here. He's saying, God will not reward us for anything that we do if it's motivated by the desire to be seen by others. God will not reward us for anything that we do if the true desire, if the true motivation is to be seen by others. In other words, there will be no reward from God for helping others or for doing those good works, or for serving in that way, or being involved with that ministry, or anything else, if our motive in doing those things was to be seen by others. And again, as I consider my own heart, as I consider my, my own motives and my struggle with my motives and how subtle, how subtle the sinful desire for self-glory can be, I mean, this is actually terrifying. The Apostle Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 up on the screen. Look what he says. He talks about this extensively. He says, Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. So he's talking to the church. He's talking to believers. And he's saying, a day is coming. Capital D day, the day of judgment. And all of our works will be exposed. Everything will be laid bare. All of our motives for what we did, it will all be exposed. Now, he's not saying that believers will be judged. We're not going to be judged. We, uh, our judgment took place at the cross, amen? amen? But our works will be. Each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. All of our works will pass through the fire of God's judgment. It will all be exposed. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So our works will pass through the fire of God's judgment. There will be works that we did for the glory of God and we will be rewarded for those things. But then there will be works that pass through the fire of God's judgment and they are burned up because it was really all about us. Paul says in that moment, there will be a sense of loss. Though he himself will be saved because we won't be judged, our works will be. And God will not reward us for anything that was motivated by the desire to be seen by others. So ask yourself, do I believe, like for real, do I believe that God's reward is better than being seen by people? Do I really believe that God's reward is better than self-glory? Do I really believe on that day, which is coming so soon, when I step into eternity, do I believe, really believe that I will experience a satisfaction and a joy and a peace and a pleasure in God and in his presence and in his glory that I can't even begin to imagine right now? And do I believe that in that moment, there will be nothing greater than for God himself to approach you in all his glory, for Jesus Christ to approach you, to look you right in your eyes. Maybe even put his hand on your shoulder 
and look you in your eyes and say to you, my child, well done. You have been faithful over a little. You lived for my glory. Now, now, I will set you over much. In Revelation chapter 22, it says that his people will worship him and they will see his face and his name will be on their forehead and night will be no more and they won't require the light of a lamp or the sun for the Lord God will be their light and they shall reign forever and ever and ever and ever. Again, do I believe that God's reward is better than being seen by people? Do I believe that God's reward is better than self-glory? Because here's the truth. There is no better reward than God's reward. There's no better reward than God's reward. And if you and I really believe that, if we really believe that God's reward is truly worth living for, then we need to listen very carefully to what Jesus is about to say next because he's about to tell us how to pursue God's reward. Look what he says now in verse 2. Jesus says, Thus, when you give to the needy, Sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. So notice first that Jesus says, when you give to the needy. He doesn't say if you give to the needy. He says when you give to the needy. Jesus fully expected that his followers, that his disciples would be compassionate, grace-filled people who love to give to the needy. He fully expected that. And one way that we do this together as a, as a body is, of course, by giving to the church. Because as you give to the church, as we give to the church, the church identifies needs and then goes and meets those needs either directly or by supporting other ministries that specialize in those areas. And there's many other ways that we can give to the needy as well. But in whatever way we give to the needy, Jesus tells us how not to do it. He tells us how not to give to the needy. Look again at verse 2. He says, thus when... When you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Now that word hypocrite there is a really important word. I mean, that is still a common word in our, in our day. But hypocrite here, it means someone who pretends. It means someone who's an actor. Someone who's wearing a mask. Someone who is just putting on a show. And the, the hypocrites that Jesus is referring to here specifically are the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees loved giving to the needy. They loved it. The Pharisees were always giving to the needy. They were all about giving to the needy. But the reason why they gave to the needy, their motive was to get the praise of man. They gave to the needy in ways that would draw all kinds of attention to themselves. So people would see how much they gave and they'd be like, oh, wow, you are such a holy man. You're so, you're so compassionate. You're, oh, you must love God so much. Jesus said, hypocrites. They're putting on a show. As one commentator put it, what they were really doing wasn't giving at all. It was purchasing. They were purchasing the praise of man by giving to the needy. That's what they were doing. They were purchasing. They are purchasing the praise of man. The currency was giving to the needy. Give to the needy. I purchased the praise of man. And Jesus says, don't be like them. Do not give to get the praise of man. Do not purchase the praise of man by giving to the needy, because if you do, this will be the outcome. Look again at verse 2. At the end of verse 2, he says, Truly I say to you, 
they have received their reward. In other words, the only reward that those who are seeking the praise of man might get, might get, is the praise of man. That's it. So we can think of it like this up on the screen. Which reward am I living for? Which reward am I living for? Am I living for God's reward or am I living for man's reward? Because God's reward is eternal. God's reward is forever. Man's reward, the praise of man, it's momentary. It's fleeting. It's here one moment, gone the next. It's like sand. God's reward is satisfying, eternally satisfying. Man's reward is ultimately empty. It's meaningless. It's useless. Living for God's reward is freedom. This is how we've been designed to live. We've been designed to live for God's reward. Living for man's reward, living for the praise of man is total bondage. It's idolatry. Living at the broken cistern of the praise of man will destroy us in a million ways. So which reward have you been living for? God's reward or man's reward? And maybe more importantly, in fact, for sure more importantly, which reward do you want to live for? Well, that leads us to our second and our final point, which is this. It's a promise. It's a promise. Here's the promise. If I give to be seen by God, I will receive God's reward. If I give to be seen by God, I will receive God's reward. Have a look now at verse 3. Jesus continues. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So here's how you and I are to give. We are to give in secret. We're to give in secret. And giving in secret does not mean this. It does not mean that, that no one ever sees you give and no one ever, ever knows about any of your giving. It doesn't mean that. Giving in secret is all about motive. Giving in secret means this. It means, it means giving to be seen by God and not with the motive to be seen by man for self-glory. That's what it means. It means giving with the motive to be seen by an audience of one and not by an audience of man. Including this one interesting and particular audience. Look again at verse 3. Notice this. Jesus says, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, don't give with the motive of being seen by yourself. Don't give with the motive so that you can congr congratulate yourself on, on all your giving. Don't give so that you can think about how generous you are and that you can admire yourself and give yourself glory. Instead, do this up on the screen. Turn away from the broken cistern of giving to be seen by others. Turn away from that broken cistern of self-glory, but also turn away from this other broken cistern of giving to be seen by self. Turn away from that broken cistern of self-glory also and do this. Give to be seen by God. Give to be seen by an audience of one. That's what he's saying. Because if we do that, here will be the outcome. Look again at verse 3. But when you give to the needy, Jesus says, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing 
so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So here's the promise right there. If we give to be seen by God, he will reward you. Jesus said it. If you give to be seen by God, God will reward you. And so how do we become people like that? I mean, consider Moses in Hebrews chapter 11. He's, he's, he, his whole life gets turned upside down. Why? Because he's looking to the reward. How do we become people like that? How do we become people who give and are generous, not to be seen by man, not to be seen by ourselves, but to be seen by God alone? Well, Thomas Chalmers said this up on the screen. It's a very famous quote. He said, Sin has a magnetic power that attracts us. And unless a greater power grips our heart, we remain powerless to change. Sin has a magnetic power that it attracts us. And unless a greater power than sin, unless a greater power grips our hearts, then we remain powerless to change. So we can think of it like this up on the screen. That the only way, the only way to turn away from those two broken cisterns, the broken cistern of giving to be seen by others, the broken cistern of giving to be seen by self, these broken cisterns of self-glory, the only way to turn away from those is to draw near to God. That's the only way. The only way is to drink from the fountain of living waters. Because as we draw near to God, by spending time with him in his word, as we draw near to God by spending time with him in his word, and as we draw near to God by spending time in prayer, as, as this is what we do, then here's what will happen up on the screen. As we draw near to him, we see who he is. We see that he is holy, holy, holy. We see that he is absolutely perfect. We see that he is perfect in love and in grace and in mercy and compassion and power and in wisdom and in beauty. As we draw near to God, we see who he is. As we draw near to God, we also are reminded of what he has done. That God the Father sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to, to suffer on a cross that, that all of our sin would be transferred to him and the wrath of God that we deserve would be poured out on him and he would make full and complete atonement for our sin and make forgiveness possible for anyone who will believe in him, anyone who will place their faith in him. As we draw near, we remember who he is. We see what he has done again and again and again. And then also this, we see what he has promised, including, including what he has promised to us tonight that if we give to be seen by him, he will reward us. So as we draw near to God and we see who he is and we see what he's done and we see what he has promised again and again and again every day as we're in the word and as we're in prayer, here's what happens up on the screen. Our hearts change. Our hearts change. Our motives change. And when our hearts are changed, this is what we do up on the screen. We worship. When our hearts are changed, we worship. And one way that we worship is by doing what God has commanded and by giving generously to the needy. Not to be seen by man, not to be seen by self, but to be seen by God alone. This is the work God does in us. As we see who he is and we see what he's done for us in the gospel and we see what he's promised us, he makes us people who give generously to the needy for an audience of one. This is the work he does in us. So ask yourself, does this describe me? Am I spending time with God? Am I meditating on who he is? Am I meditating on what he's done for me? Am I meditating on what he's promised me? Am I spending time with God and is he working in my heart, giving me a burden to give to the needy? Does this describe me? 
Has he been bringing to my mind the specific needs of certain people in ways that I can give? Could it be that today God is calling us in a new way to give in secret? Could it be that today God is calling us to give in new ways to be seen by him? Could it be that today God is calling us to give to the needy, to shine light that he would get glory? Jesus said that at the judgment, he will say this to his people. I'm going to read this to you from Matthew chapter 25. The words of Jesus. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? When? They're legitimately confused because they're not reciting this to themselves all the time. They're not reminding themselves of how generous they are. When? And the king will answer them. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. It's astounding. And today he says to us, not if you give to the needy, when you give to the needy. As one of these ones Jesus will be speaking to at the judgment. When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Let's pray. So, Father, one of the things that we love about your word is that you command us to do the very things we want to do. You, you say, go and live this way. And it, it just resonates in our heart because the spirit of God is saying, yes, yes, that is good. That is right. And our spirit echoes that sentiment and says, yes, our new hearts say, yes. Giving to the needy, yes. Not living for my own glory, yes. Living for the glory of God, yes. So God, thank you. Thank you that you call us to do the very things that you've placed in our hearts to do. God, we thank you that at one time, when we were your enemies, when we were at our worst, that day when we were at our absolute worst, you loved us and saved us. And you haven't loved us and saved us for a life that is not fruitful. You've loved us and you've saved us to participate with you in the advancement of your kingdom, in, in making disciples, in loving God and loving neighbor. And so Lord, we thank you again for your word. And we pray that you would help us now to respond in obedience to it. In Jesus' name, amen.